today. It's my great pleasure to welcome Ms. Joy Wango from TCC Africa, the Executive Director of TCC Africa, the Training Center in Communication based in Kenya, serving the whole continent of Africa. Welcome, Joy. Thank you, Joe. So it's a, it's, yeah, the pleasure is immeasurable. And um, not only because it's always nice talking to you, also we are closely collaborating through our work with Africa Archive, the synergies we have discovered between TCC Africa and Africa Archive. And now to give our conversation a head start, could you please share with us how did TCC come into existence? What was um, from what I what I heard from you, TCC is older than 15 years now. So we've been on, right. we've been in operations for more than 15 years. What were the gaps that TCC has set out to close 15 years ago in science okay. communication on the continent? So TCC Africa started honestly by accident because uh, at that point uh, in 2006, I we had. I was a communications manager for a biosafety and biotechnology project that was uh, that was in, in the University of Nairobi, and uh, the one thing we noted within the project was that the biosafety and the biotechnology researchers could not communicate amongst themselves, and they're in the same project. So the first thing that came to mind was we need to teach them how to communicate amongst themselves, and that meant uh, even before the word there was a definition for scholarly communication. So that meant scientific writing and making sure that the way they wrote those papers, each these researchers from different fields could understand what was put in the papers. And when we critically look at the situation, because this project was not only at the University of Nairobi, but it was in uh, the University of Dar es Salaam, Makerere University, University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, Makerere University in Uganda, and it, it was also in partnership with University of Copenhagen and Aarhus University in Denmark, we realized that this is just not a, a researcher issue or an early career issue, an early career researcher issue. It was an institutional problem. So it turns out that um, the, the lead of that project, Professor Gabor Lovai, who ended up becoming the founding direct, co-founding director of TCC Africa had been offering training on scientific writing. As I said, there was no definition yet on, on the, on, there was no term yet on scholarly communication. It was just scientific writing. For postgraduate students in Denmark, and the idea was to make them understand their scientific writing process. And with time, we, we pitched to the University of Nairobi and we told them, listen, We've noticed this in a project within the University of Nairobi. I'm sure it's a bigger problem within the, with the greater academic community. And it was true. They realized the top research producing area, uh, research areas, uh, namely health and agricultural sciences, yes, were producing quite a, a number of publications, but researchers within the university who are not in those research areas could not read or understand, could not understand what was written in those papers. So the first thing that the University of Nairobi did was make sure, was partner with us and then make sure that their entire academic community was continuously trained on scientific writing. Mm. And um, as we're going through that, um, the very first training we did was in, uh, actually was not even in Kenya, was in October in 2005 in, uh, in uh, Makerere University. Then December 2006 was the first training we did in partnership now with the University of Nairobi. And out of that, now we've been training at least four or five times a year and supporting the, the early career researchers. As we were supporting the researchers, we noticed that it was also an there were several administrative dynamics impeding the production of good quality uh, research output. So not uh, within the university. So, we started now working closely with the supervisors. We started working with the library within the university and guiding the library on journal selection strategy, mitigating predatory publishing with the supervisors, how they can work closely with their students in making sure that they are able to produce, to publish in good quality journals and to, to effectively write better papers. Now, you need to understand that at that point, this was in 2006, there was no university in Kenya that had a writing center. 
-hmm. scientific writing fell under writing skills or communication skills. So it was a by the way program that was just provided which when you're about to do your, your thesis or mm -hmm. when you're writing your project. But since setting up TCC Africa, now we have universities that have set up centers purposely uh, uh, create, uh, whose, um, whose mandate is to support the, their, their respective academic communities in scholarly communication. So Kenyatta University has one, Strathmore University has one, and a few other universities have set up such centers. We never had such. And with time, what we are seeing is now universities are seeing the importance of supporting their early career researchers in producing good quality research output, bearing in mind it is also now a mandate that before students graduate, they must have published and they must publish in good quality journals as well. Mm -hmm. So it has been a journey. We've been, we are proud to have been one of the influencers in setting up some of those uh, acts, mandates and acts, uh, uh, mandates that have been implemented within the University Act, because really when you look at a university, it's not just an issue of producing research, but making sure that that research is visible. And, it's also me and it also means that um, researchers need to understand each other. So it started with, you need to know how to write a good paper to how to write a good paper that researchers who are not in your field can understand. Also, it led to giving talks and conferences and workshops and making sure researchers who are not in your field can understand. Then the next step was letting non-scientists understand your work. So in, in a nutshell, really, we have pretty much trained and we are supporting and empowering researchers because it's the communication starts from them. Mm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and your portfolio of workshops and trainings grew with the demand that researchers also brought to the table, like this is what we need to know and we would appreciate guidance on how to go about. Yeah, yeah. And we, we had to adapt because the put, in the beginning it was pretty much scientific writing, but then it expanded, the portfolio expanded. It, it included uh, general selection strategy, which never, never was an issue, but because, and the general selection strategy came as a result of predatory publishing, mm. okay? The rise of predatory publishing. Then it has expanded to open science and open access, mainly because we are looking at how do you improve research output? How do you increase research visibility? You need open access and open science to help you with that. So also making researchers understand the concepts in open science and open access, not only researchers, but also administrators in universities. And what, but most importantly, how they can take advantage of that to help them increase their visibility and also help to improve their output. So we are in a situation whereby when we're training early career researchers is making them understand these are the solutions that are available to help increase your visibility and output. When you're working with administrators is making them understand that this is how you need to uh, adopt, this is why you need to adopt to, to open science and open access to help make your university much more competitive. Because today universities have now understand, even though I could say it is, it has been a, a bit of a slow process because universities traditionally have been just producing research. They never saw themselves from a com from a competitive nature unless from a, an academic perspective, but now they're seeing themselves competitive, even from a business perspective, they're seeing themselves as businesses, okay? Mm -hmm. And because they're seeing themselves as businesses, they understand the power of publishing in the right journals. They understand the power of how open science and open access can help them become more competitive. So now when you're talking to administrators within universities, they understand how, these trends in academic publishing can help them become more competitive. And beyond that, we started working with policymakers because at the end of the day, it's the policymakers who will be collating all this information to talk about the research output that is coming out from their countries. So making them understand the importance of pushing the adopt, push, pushing for the adoption for open science and open access practices because they have a strong correlation on scholarly communication and the outputs that come out of it. So mm -hmm. it has been, we've been forced to be dynamic and adapt because at the end of the day, it is producing good quality research output and increasing your visibility. Yeah. Yeah. And um, now that you mentioned that universities and scholarly institutions 
increasingly see themselves as business entities. I'd like to maybe come back to that, to, to that, yeah, to that point with regards to if we consider ourselves as businesses or as basically service providers, we're here to serve a purpose as yeah. a university, as a researcher, it's to accumulate knowledge and then to disseminate it. And the same is true for an institution. So I just want to avoid a misconception by some of our listeners that seeing an university as a business doesn't mean that it's only out for prestige or metrics yeah. or numbers, but mm -hmm. it actually serves a purpose and it needs yeah. a level of discoverability, a level of yes. presence online mm -hmm. and like, yeah, the, and like universities need to be visible for the research output they their the staff produces for the accumulation of knowledge, the contribution to global research exchange, and also yeah. not the least to solve the the issues and the challenges we're dealing with as a, as African scholars, but also as a global scientific community. And 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 most importantly, as you're saying all that the investors need to have a learning on how they can be sustainable, mm. okay? Because funding is becoming less. So with funding becoming less, they have to have innovative ways of raising money. They have to be a bit more strategic about the kind of research collaborations they're doing to help attract that, attract funding, attract collaborators, especially with industry, and also uh, increase their visibility. You see, so that's, that's the business side. So when we are talking about the business side, uh, view uh, listeners when you're talking about the business side of the of the university it's how can a university become more sustainable and relevant mm. and there and and producing good quality research output increased visibility adoption of practices that can help increase that visibility and make them competitive and open science being one of those open science and open access being one of those is really important because that has a very strong relation with the kind of scholarly communication output that would come out mm. from the institution and also the relevance that they would have uh, in, the, in, in, in the economy. Yeah, so as I understand entrepreneurship or running a business nowadays for myself as an entrepreneur, but also at institutional level for, even if it's a nonprofit organization, it's to be able to see the connecting dots and to, yeah, as you said, yeah. to, to run an organization in a sustainable, sustainable manner. Yeah. And there's also an increasing misconception, or it's not a misconception, it's also a, a reality that open access for some journals and some publishers tends to be extremely expensive to, yeah, to, to get published as a researcher or yeah. for institutions to sign up to agreements. And and that's that's a, an issue and a problem in Western countries, like in the in North America and and Central and Western Europe, but also in other regions of this world, mm -hmm. and in, especially so also in Africa. So when it comes to visibility and discoverability, of course, we want to make sure that the research is being shared in highly qualitative outlets meaning journals mm. and publishers mm. but the question is what should be the cost and who's gonna cover the cost so this is from from the conversations the work we do with with our collaboration on tcc african africa archive as well we are constantly also in, um, interrogating and trying to negotiate to find ways to keep scholarship and scientific Science, science communication affordable also for African scholars in mm. international and an international and global globally inclusive scholarly community. These are all big words, but I hope we can still follow each other. So what yeah. what's what's our approach when I say us and ours is like TCC Africa I've got collaboration, but also TCC's approach. And um, let's talk a little bit about um, the partnerships that you've established as TCC. Um, and then also later in what we're now uh, doing and working together towards. But yeah. could, you, could you explore a little bit on the existing partnerships that you've established 
with TCC Africa and other organizations inside Africa and also outside and okay. how that's serving African scholarship. Okay, so we are working closely. So I'll start with Africa. We are working closely with the Association of African Universities. Uh, we are working closely with African Journal Online. So I'll start with the African Association of Universities. So with the, object, the objective of our partnership with the African Association, Association of African Universities, the AAU, is create awareness amongst vice chancellors and leadership in the universities, in African universities, on the importance of creating open access and open science mandates. Because we've noticed, and this is something I keep on saying, let's not romanticize the whole process of open science because there's been pushback. There's been pushback on the adoption of open science and open access. And interestingly enough, the pushback is coming from researchers, mm. right? Mainly because when it comes to cost, you cannot ignore that, it comes down, it comes to cost and also a lack of proper understanding and awareness of what open access and open science entails. Mm. So we are working closely with the AAU to make sure that we, 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 we create this awareness amongst the vice chancellors and the leadership amongst universities so they can understand why we, why we have the UNESCO recommendations on open science and how it would benefit the university, how it would help the university become competitive. So that is with the AAU. Then we are look, we've also recently partnered uh, with, uh, what was the second one? African Journals Online. And these are just some of them. With African Journals Online is, the, the, for context everyone, African Journals Online is Africa's only bibliographic database. So it, 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 uh, it's a database of African journals. And out of the, out of 23 or 24 African countries, we only have 553 journals indexed in African journals online. Don't get me wrong, they are working around the clock, but that also is telling because they, you, in order to produce good quality journals, you, just, you need to meet the general publishing and practicing standards that have been set so that your journal can be indexed. So it is such a process as well to have your journal indexed. So we have about 500, over 500 good, quality journals that are already indexed in African journals online. And so why we are working with them is to create awareness on that. So to help also small academic publishers to know what it takes to have your journals indexed, helping researchers, uh, academic publishers understand the importance of, of using uh, digital object identifiers in increasing the visibility of their journals because you increase the visibility of the journal, you increase the visibility of the output that comes out of it. So it's this kind of partnership for us is purely on creation of awareness on open science and open access, the opportunities that are available in open access and open science. As you can see, they are very strategic. So if you're looking at with African Journals Online, it's targeting the small academic publishers. So when you're looking at small academic publishers, you're looking at institutes or even universities that have journals. Um, if you're looking at the Association of African Universities, it means that you're working with the leadership within the universities. We're also working with library consortia, various library consortia. And this is in making sure that they have access to resources that they can use, open access resources they can use for their for their recipient, respective academic communities as well. And this is extremely important because we need to include all stakeholders in higher education because we, this is the open access conversation is not a library conversation. It's a high education conversation. So we bring in all these high education stakeholders within the continent. And we look at their strengths and we build on those strengths to create awareness. So with the library consortia is working with the library and inviting all the librarians under their consortia to make them understand and what it entails to, to be involved, to, to adopt open access and open science and what opportunities are there. That is locally, that is continentally. Um, globally, we are, we are partnered with digital science and uh, we've also partnered with PLOS. So with, with digital science, the objective is, and also now with eLife as well. And uh, what we've done is that with eLife, we are training researchers uh, on peer review. We, we not actually, it's not an issue of training researchers on peer review, but coming up with a sustainable approach for peer review, for, for creating, producing African 
peer reviewers, okay? And making the whole process inclusive, whereby there's an African voice when it comes to peer review. Mm. Then um, with digital science, what you're trying to do is create an increase, an awareness on open access and open science on some of their open access solutions, uh, which are citation databases, uh, including dimensions. Uh, among uh, among uh, other solutions that they have that are open access. The reason for this is because commercially citation databases have fallen under the two big players and that is um, Web, of, uh, Web of Science by Clarivate Analytics or Scopus by Elsevier. Mm -hmm. And the reality is they are so expensive, they're extremely expensive very few institutions can afford it. Very few institutions can afford it in the continent. So the fact that this, that digital science has open access citation databases that do more or less the same kind of functionalities or even better is what you're trying to make sure that researchers have this database that they can use on top of the existing bibliographic databases mm -hmm. to help produce good quality research output, to help also mitigate predatory publishing because it already comes with journals. So in essence, you're trying to change the narrative from saying that we don't have resources, that we have resources, we just need to choose what works for us. Mm -hmm. uh, with PLOS, what you're doing is creating awareness on open access and uh, open access, especially at a, at a policy level amongst the African higher education stakeholders, making them understand the opportunities that are available in open access and particularly the global equity program that they had really been, that PLOS has been really pushing for, uh, for researchers from the global south. So this is extremely important because this came as a need because of the high costs, and we can't ignore that. There, there are some, some exorbitant costs that come with open access, depending on where you're publishing. And researchers from the Global South, again, were falling through the cracks. So the rise of this global equity program is making it possible for researchers in the globe for, for researchers in the global south to, to 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 benefit from it but also for publishers to be part of that program and have either provide equitable prices or free options for researchers to publish in some of their titles that are open access. So this is really important for us because what you're trying to say is that we are creating awareness on open access and open science. We're also creating the, showing them, showing African high, high education stakeholders the opportunities that exist in open science and open access. We really want to change the narrative on the visibility of African research output. And we've noted is it's because of lack of infrastructure, awareness and also infrastructure. And our most access to infrastructure and our most recent and exciting partnership is with Africa Archive. Now, being the only preprint repository in the continent that supports the research output produced in the continent or about the continent is a game changer for African research because we're in a situation whereby literally any institute that has a repository can have their work indexed in Africa archive. And what does that mean? It means visibility of the output, seeing the, the true picture of the output that is coming out of that institute. And also the opportunity to showcase research done in different languages, uh, indigenous languages, or they could be national or in, they, they're indigenous languages, but they happen to be also the national languages of the respective countries is a game changer because it means that we are going in line with the Helsinki Declaration in making sure that uh, indigenous knowledge and also indigenous language is also used as a contributing factor in the visibility of research output. Mm. So, Africa, the visibility, the kind of partnership we, the kind of partnerships we are creating are heavily embedded on the visibility of African research output and also supporting the production of good quality African research output. So the narrative, I'm hoping in five years, the narrative will be okay, what kind of resources can we use? Can we, can we build up on to improve our research output? Or 
what kind of resources can we work with to further increase the visibility of our output? Not that there is nothing available to help in supporting our research output, improving in producing good policy research output, and also increasing the visibility of the output. So the kind of partnerships we've made, I'm, I'm truly excited about them because they are a make or break on the kind of, on the visibility of African research output. And also it breaks, it stops the narrative, the, the pessimistic narrative we've always had about the kind of output that is coming out of Africa. So there's definitely um, a positive vibe when it comes to African research output, because there are solutions that have been provided. Knowing very well, knowing very well that finances and economies are tight or countries are not investing as much in higher education and research, but they are, they are investing, but not as much. Not, let's not say that they're not investing, they're investing, but not as much. However, there are opportunities that are available mm. that are either, uh, uh, that, that are there are opportunities that are available that would help increasing their research visibility, and also producing uh, opportunities that are available that would help in producing good quality research output. And most importantly, the fact that there are global equity programs that are rising to make it to create a leveling plane for African researchers to competitively compete with uh, researchers in the global north. That the way I see it also, and I think we, we agree on that, is there is a need and an opportunity for investment in the region, also when it comes mm. to scholar, scholarly infrastructure. And not to see it as it's often the case, like, oh, we're waiving the fees, all oh, those poor African scholars are mm. board, but like history happened, is what I tend to say when, when we talk about Africa Archive. Like, let's acknowledge that history happened without blaming or shaming anyone today. Yes. just happen and mm -hmm. we need to look at the realities that we're facing today and yes. there is profit being made by some of the stakeholders like for the most part the publishers and mm -hmm. each of them has their own business model to sustain their services which are of high mm -hmm. quality and now what we're doing together in this partnership between tcc africa and africa is also to negotiating around so balancing what's the capacity the financial capacity of the African scholars, which is also diverse, um, mm. looking at private universities versus public ones, and then um, the um, the economic strengths of of some countries over others. Um, yeah. So we're looking at that, and also like what's the business model that that a publisher or a journal chose for their sustainable plan sustainability plan and how can we find an agreement that makes everybody happy meaning that yes. allows everyone on the table to sustain their business without having to give in too much which then becomes painful and a struggle to keep up the partnership <laughs> that's quite a balancing yes. act but also it's quite quite an informative journey and i i personally enjoy it very much and yes and it's, it's about acknowledging. So yes, there's there's expensive, there's there's a price tag that comes with publishing in certain journals and other certain publishers. And they mm -hmm. also provide quality of research. There's other business models that are basically when we look at diamond open access journals and many of which are also in Africa where there's other means to, to sustain the services by the scholarly publishers yeah are not to publish and so the the fees are not as high and still the mm. quality is good another aspect is like don't worry so much where you publish but rather what you publish about like what's the research output you want to disseminate how can you yes, yes. the audience that are trying to target here like who needs to know what you've come up with yes and for that the important the only thing that you need to look at is the journal online and they can also choose any of the African journals. Online. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, or I mean, more about like, and for that it's important also for a, for a publishing strategy or a journal selection strategy. But if you want to publish in a plus journal, good and fine, but just make sure that the scope that they've chosen for their operations meets 
the audience that you're trying to target with that you're target you're trying to target absolutely and and that's those are the kind of conversations that have been done right now and i mean you mentioned something about diamond open access journals and i know that is what is being pushed for but the reality is this is my observation and my opinion the diamond open access journals can work in certain regions and not all region and, and not in other regions, mm. mainly because it is 100% free. But for it to be 100% free, it means that somebody is paying for it at the back. Yeah. Sure. Okay. And we need to be very clear on who is going to pay for exactly, it. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So we we cannot force models that work in certain areas into designing regions simply because you want free access to the data. We need to ask ourselves, because this is long-term, so you yeah. need to look at a sustainable approach to it and ask ourselves, fine, if you are going to have diamond open access journals, who is going to pay for it? And when you're thinking about that, we need to ask ourselves in the countries that we are targeting, what, what are their open access mandates? what policies have they said because a country that has an open access policy will have ways to see how because it is an act of parliament they'll see how they can include it within the budget or create a small budget for it create a small budget for it because it's an act of parliament mm -hmm. but a country that has no open access policy or active open access mandate that we need to figure out you start. Yeah. exactly so if these are, these are, that's what I'm saying, there'll be, there'll never be a dull moment mm. in academic publishing uh, and also scholarly communication and our role in supporting African researchers, improving their output and increasing their visibility because it's always dynamic. There'll always be things coming up mm. and there'll always be developments coming up. And as I said, the most recent one is on diamond open access. And we will be now, the next question is, how do you make it sustainable? Because it's not an issue of creating awareness on open access or this type of uh, or this type of open access, but it's an issue of saying, how can you make that type of open access sustainable? So maybe at that point, who knows, the conversations will be with governments. How much can you apportion to, to higher education and STI? They're already doing that, especially the countries that have committed at least 1% of their GDP in higher education and research. We do have countries that have committed to that. And within those, within those countries that have committed at least 1% of their GDP in higher education and research, the question is, how much are you going to put for publishing? Okay, because all those countries that are adopting open access, they are, they are pushing for open access. Those that have committed 1% of their GDP mm -hmm. in higher education and research, they're pushing for open access and open science. And that's a good thing. That is step number one. Step number two, how much are you going to put aside for to su su support and sustain diamond open access journals? So let's say the top universities, the top research producing universities or the top research institutes. So you have like five, diamond open access journals coming from Kenya? How much are you willing to, to, to support? Because it costs money. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we really need to, to look at. And that's where everybody is fumbling. We cannot say we are going to get funding. I, I don't like that narrative of funding. Funding is leads to dependency theory, uh, theory whereby you're constantly reliant on it. You're not focusing on the, the work at hand because you're trying to figure out, I need to get, in, I need to get the next funding cycle and you're heavily, unfortunately, reliant on the economy, the political economy of the day on the person who is giving you the funding. So it's not sustainable. So if somebody's going to talk about diamond open access, they should not come with a funding model. They should come with a business sustainable model. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. So there's two things to look at when we talk about diamond open access. What I meant earlier in this conversation was if you're hit by a price tag that's beyond what you can afford as a researcher, oh, yes. then there's other options available. Mm. But if we now talk about, oh, let's just set up diamond open access outlets yeah. in Africa, that's a totally different story and conversation. It's, it's so I mean, I, 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 to, to approach. That's I, true because I've started seeing the, the conversations in Africa and and I shudder because we're already struggling in trying to get infrastructural systems just for open science. 
Mm. You know, we are struggling or making researchers understand the need to update existing systems, you know, with that already open access. Systems, uh, like the you space know. and the space, space. Yeah. yeah. Mm. You know, and then you're saying you're going to throw in op diamond open access. I'm like, yeah, brilliant. Come with the money. <laughs> I was going to pay for that. I think the diamond of an access, the access journals that exist, they are mostly run on an institutional level. So the, yes, the government yes, in Europe never yes, that's were involved. But yes, when it comes to Africa, you can expect for the tight budget yeah. to just randomly. In, in, yeah, hmm. they're, they're institutional based. They are, and they, and uh, it's, and the, the one, if you look at the institute, it has maybe an open access mandate because the librarian or actually it's normally the librarian who's pushed for it. Mm. So the ones I've interacted with is because the librarian has pushed for it. So it's this kind of awareness that we really need to create so that people can understand. We don't, when you're, when you're training, when you're training stakeholders on how to improve their research visibility in, especially through open access and open science, we don't want them to be overrun by the white noise, but to look at, at the priorities of their countries and how open science can help increase the increase the, the knowledge, in, can help build the knowledge economy in their respective countries. And the, looking at pragmatic approaches as well. Yeah. yeah, this is also how we're operating with Africa, Archive, where we do the work that we do using existing infrastructure Mm -hmm. And yes, it's also Western based, but it works yeah. and it's built for a global scientific it's, community. So the world is we're, global. We cannot yeah. say you cannot just say Pan African. It's Pan African looking global. It is global looking at Pan African, you know. So we work with systems that are there and build on them. Exactly. Yeah. And, so and learn from for, those systems and create our own. You know, they've already been there. So learn exactly. from the mistakes, avoid That's them. And, how Europe yeah. is doing it. I mean, it's like see who does it first, observe, yeah. learn from it, and then implement yourself. Yeah, that's how it is. That's how it is. And 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 that is why, uh, as TCC Africa, as I said, this is the kind of awareness we are creating. So that we we always tell, we always tell the stakeholders that we are working with, we, we are very pragmatic, and we tell them, listen, um, we 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 break it down. On making them understand what open access and open science is, what it entails, and we don't romanticize it. Okay, the costs because there are costs involved. Okay, and what once and the, but then it is the grand benefit out of it. Mm. Yeah, it's the grand benefit out of it, and it's at this point that whenever we are doing these trainings and workshops, we are very clear what the expected output is, so that we are able to build up on that. Be able to build up on that so um it's 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 exciting times for tcc africa we started on just the aspect of writing good quality papers mm -hmm. and it we realize it's bigger than that you're looking at you need to publish in a good journal then it led to where do i identify these good journals then also working with supervisors because you know, the supervisors are going to guide you in that whole process. Then understanding the di administrative dynamics and challenges that a university goes through. So even when we are supporting, we are coming to universities and telling them, listen, we want to support your academic community in improving their research output through scholarly and science communication. It's working closely with the vice chancellors and the deputy vice chancellors and assuring them that we are not taking over their systems, mm -hmm. but recognizing the challenges that they are facing in supporting the academic community and working with them to achieve that goal, you see? Um, and then we realize now we have to work with the governments, you know, with the governments, you're, you're the same ones who are saying that you need to produce good quality output, but you're, you're not telling us how, <laughs> how that's going to be done. So, <laughs> hey, you got to love governments. <laughs> so you know, you say you must produce good quality output. You must publish in good journals. And how are we going to do that? Yeah, we need a little bit of cash flow in order to be doing that. <laughs> lots and lots of crickets. <laughs> so, <laughs> so working with them in, in those understanding, because you see, at the end of the day, they are policymakers. They are held accountable on the, the on the on the representation on the research coming out of the country. 
you know? So working with them so that they can know the narrative. So when they're saying, okay, we want to put quality outputs, this is what we are talking about. This is how we want it. Mm -hmm. So, and you're seeing a change, you're seeing the adoption and it's exciting that even we are working with the East African community, the East African community uh, parliament through that. So the IUCA is interested in that, the Inter-University Council of East Africa, that falls under the East African community parliament. The East African Commission for Science and Technology is interested in that, that is the, is, uh, that is the, 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 this, the regional council for all research councils in Eastern and Eastern Africa. You see, when you start working at policy level, it means that they are keen to know, okay, so how can we work together to make this work? Mm -hmm. Okay, to support our research institute, to support our universities. What is the messaging that we should use? Because mm -hmm. we want good quality outputs. That's what they want. We want so that when we are when we are when we are when we are giving a representation of Africa or East Africa rather, we are talking about this is the amount of output we produce and it's good quality output. But how do we? What kind of messaging should we use? How mm -hmm. should we guide them? And mm -hmm. that's the level we've reached. So it's aside from hey, write a good paper to policymakers saying, how can we work together in supporting our respective institutions, whether it's universities or research councils in producing good quality outputs? What kind of open access mandates should we support them with in creating uh, systems that would help in improving their research output and increasing their visibility? Mm. Mm. Well, it's 15 wow. years so, and loading. Oh yeah. Mm. Um, so what now, Having looked at the past fifteen years in like in speed through, like how TCC Africa emerged, what your mandates have been, how it's changed over time, we're currently working with, and now how do you envision the next five, ten, fifteen years? Like, will TCC Africa ever be done with the kind of work you're doing, or like what what will be in place and what will what would you think and guess from what we know today? Obviously, we can't look into the future just yet. Um, how? What we, yeah. What What's gonna be the the most important thing to work on in fifteen years from now? So let, let's start with what I do not expect to happen. Mm -hmm. I do not expect that would be working with governments in making them understand the importance of scholarly communication and now with the rise of open access and open science. I never expected that, mainly because we thought this was an institutional problem. So, and that has taught me to be on guard for the unexpected. So to watch the trends mm -hmm. and quickly adopt to it, all right? So I can comfortably say in the next five years that would want the narrative on African research visibility to change that 0.1% is visible, but say that we are adopting technology and open science to help increase the visibility of African research output. That's what, that's the narrative I want to see because the reason why we were not visible is not because we're not producing research, it's because we do not have our infrastructural systems to support. And now we have open science. So I want the narrative to change that to the uh, that we are aggressively adopting open science technologies to help in increasing research visibility. Mm -hmm. Okay. In five years, I'm I'm envisioning better research output being produced because we are no longer tied to the kind of journals we can publish in. We are no longer tied to the avenues in which we can publish in. Okay. But because let's, let's rephrase it because the production is still happening. It's just it's not it's not going through. It's being clocked in, yeah, and bottlenecks. It's, it's slowly changing. You see, the thing is, before, yeah. I mean, when we started this, you know, it was, wow, it, it it was okay. Yes, you've written your paper. We need to identify where to publish. You don't know where to publish. Or then all of a sudden it came with predatory publishing. Now I'm scared to publish. <laughs> So, so, you know, it, 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 was, it was such a scary time for African researchers mm -hmm. and all oh, the top researchers only in health and agriculture sciences because, you know, that's where the big money is, you know. So now we're in a situation whereby we know where to publish. We have various portals that are availed to us on where to publish. We are more aware of the journals that Africans are producing. Okay, and these are good quality journals. So you can't say that, oh, we don't have access to African journals. You already have good quality. And I, 
it's not much, but I think 500 is a lot to start with. That mm -hmm. you have 500 journals that are multidisciplinary for African researchers to publish in that are African produced. So in the next five years, who knows? There could be more. There'll be 500 more. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we but, have. So yeah. the narrative. Yeah, the narrative is changing. So I I envision a time when we may not need to say that we do not know where we are publishing because oh we we have better we are producing better research output because we have the access to more resources on where to publish and understanding on what it takes to publish. But most importantly, if I look at it from an an agenda twenty sixty three perspective, when you're looking at the Africa we want. I'm looking at a situation whereby we have built such strong knowledge economies in the continent and we are active producers of research and innovation. I am looking at situations like in the case COVID-19 is a classic example. We are seeing uh, research clusters and groups being produced in Africa just purely on COVID-19, okay? Nigeria has one, South Africa has one. And these are, these are research groups that are attracting not only funding, but international global, uh, internationalization through these research collaborations. So I'm looking at, I'm envisioning a situation whereby we are leading the narrative in some of the top research areas that are relevant in Africa, whether it is tropical, medicine, whether it is uh, mobile money because it came from Africa, and it's, it's mobile money uh, or fintech, anything in fintech, you know, mm -hmm. it mostly came from Africa really, and it has been adopted. So any innovation is backed up with research mm -hmm. because we have access to the data, we have access to, the, to, the, to, the, to, to, to resources that can help in producing good quality research output. And also it is backed up with open science and open access. So people are, are seeing it and it's much more accessible. And also so protected fact, from misappropriation because- Exactly, yeah, exactly. So, license. and it leads to the next thing, research sovereignty. So everything is protected. So that's what, so this is what I'm seeing. I'm looking at research, the, in, the increased awareness of ownership of research. So that's leading to research sovereignty and for us leading in, in, in the kind of research that needs to be done on and about Africa. Not the mandate of the funder, but these are our problems. This is the kind of research that we want done. These are the kind of collaborators that we want to work with because they understand what our needs are. Yes. And also what the gain is in collaborating. Mm. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. And that's what I see happening in the next five years with some of the activities we are doing because we're already seeing the change. Mm -hmm. We're already seeing the change. We're seeing, we seeing increased research visibility per institute. And of course, there are so many factors uh, that lead to it. But the one thing that you're seeing is open access and publishing in an understanding of the publishing process. And, yes, and when I say this, it's increasing because I look at what we call the neglected sciences, you know, the social sciences and arts and humanities. The natural sciences, life sciences, there's a lot. You always see outputs coming out. But then the, the social sciences and arts and humanities, it's not as much and not as fast. But now you're seeing a lot of it because yes, they have access to resources. They have uh, to, to publish, to, to produce good quality, to produce better papers. So we are seeing a change. Mm -hmm. And also higher education stakeholders getting much more involved in the trends in academic publishing and how the impact it and, and scholarly communication and academic publishing and the impact it has on the overall output coming out of their respective countries and regions as well. Mm -hmm. So that's what I see happening. I just already said it happening, but I also see happening in the, the next five years. But as I said in the beginning, I'm also reading the room because during those five years, anything else could happen and we, we just need to learn to adapt and go with the flow. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's a nice outlook. And also thanks for summarizing the observations and um, presenting here with us. Um, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I, I don't know now to put in words how glad I am that we're collaborating so closely and we're on this journey together. Thanks very much for joining us today. 
We are yeah. on a yeah on a great mission. Also, we are very happy to collaborate, as you've heard us explain, like our various partnerships. So whoever is listening, um, feel free to reach out to us, um, either by email through the link in the show notes or in the in the associated blog post. Um, you can reach Joy through info at tccafrica.org. Um, also, there is mentoring programs. So for scholars, irrespective of your career level, you can also join the TCC Africa community and book courses from the portfolio that TCC is offering. So there's many ways and opportunities to engage with TCC, with our joint activities with Africa Archive and TCC Africa. And also here with access to perspective. So we are all one big scholarly family and inviting yes. you to engage with us and to grow with us and for the betterment of scholarship on a global scale and also for the continent that is Africa. Asante yes. Sana, thank you so much. You, you uh, are welcome, Asante Sana. And have a great day and speak soon. Super. Mm -hmm.